<coughs> and uh, for the sake of the three newcomers, we normally have some sort of reading. So we're working through this wonderful book by Bhikkhu Bodhi, the uh, Social and Communal Harmony book, uh, the anthology, an anthology of discourses from the Pali Canon. He's done another one as well called In the Word of the Buddha, I think, um, which is more uh, meaty, or should we say hearty? Let's say hearty instead, and goes through all the teachings. But this one also goes through key teachings in various um, themes. And we are still on the chapter on anger. And it's interesting to see how much dialogue comes around this. I'm always quite amazed that we've only passed sort of three or four pages <laughs> in many, many classes. And so that's a good thing because these sort of discussions are meant to be discussions. It's not um, for me to tell you how to interpret or understand the teachings, but for you to learn to apply them and to reflect on how you might understand them in a way that helps you in your life. And um, <clears throat> so, Basically, we will start from where we are, and I think really anywhere you pick this book up is, uh, you know, you don't need to have read the previous chapters. But if you have a copy of the book, it's nice to read the little introductions to each chapter because Bhikkhu Bodhi gives a nice overview. So today we're starting on page 56. So for those with the book, I'll give you a chance to open it while I have a sip of tea. <coughs> And please don't worry if you have to leave it early. <laughs> That's fine, Leila. <clears throat> so today we're on the, I don't know why it says number six. I guess this is the sixth theme. Removing anger. And we're starting with the 10 ways to eliminate resentment. So for those joining only from now, of course, there have been other different ways of uh, eliminating resentment and, of course, ways that we actually increase resentment as well. <clears throat> but the Buddha tends to put things in themes for the sake of um, ease of memorization, I think, more than anything else. And uh, so each time anger is discussed or uh, represented, it will be done in slightly different ways. And just, uh, it's quite interesting to see how perhaps some of these things might apply to us or can help us in some way, or maybe not. So I'll read through this uh, little passage from the anger to a 10, and then we can have a bit of discussion or some questions. And for the discussion, we usually ask you to raise your virtual hand by using the button at the bottom of the screen. And one of our co-hosts, I'm not sure, is it Kelly today? Hi, Kelly. She will unmute you and call out your name and give you the go-ahead to speak. So we do that just to organise things well and to make sure the environment is very safe and uh, conducive. So let's begin. And of course, very often the language here is gendered. Sometimes... Uh, Maybe it's relevant to be gendered and other times, perhaps not. Perhaps we can make it more inclusive, at least for our sessions together. <coughs> so excuse me, I've, I'm, I'm definitely not having COVID, but I've just got a little bit of a, a throat thing. But yeah, I can be sure I haven't because I'm just super careful. I don't really see anybody. So here we go. The 10 ways to eliminate resentment community, there are these 10 ways of removing resentment. What 10? Thinking, they acted for my harm, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. Thinking, they are acting for my harm, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. Thinking, they will act for my harm, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. And then we go into, uh, hmm, what's the difference here? Okay, there's lots of dot, dot, dots. I'll just read it out and try to figure it out. So number four, thinking they acted for my harm, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. Thinking they are acting for my harm, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. They will act for the, ah, okay, sorry. So the next chapter 
is about people who are acting for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable to ourselves. Okay, so in the first instant, we're thinking, okay, they're acting for my harm, but we can't do much about it, basically. So it sort of implies a sense of acceptance. And in this case, so number four, five and six, it's when people are acting for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable. And we also think what can be done about it. So in this way, one removes resentment. And then uh, the next one's quite interesting. So thinking they acted or they are acting or they will act for the benefit of one who is displeasing and disagreeable to me, but what can be done about it? One removes resentment. And the last one, one does not become angry without a reason. These community are the 10 ways of removing resentment. So we can see that this is a little bit similar to a previous sutta that we read on the seven dangers, where we were um, seeing how sometimes we can feel quite happy if somebody acts in the disinterest of one of our enemies, but we can feel quite happy and even think of somebody as a very good person and feel very affectionate towards them if they treat somebody we love with a lot of uh, consideration or respect. So in that way, we tend to club together, don't we, with people who kind of like what we like or like who we like, and we dislike people who don't um, like who we like. But in the same way, sometimes we're kind of quite stingy and not wanting the benefit and the happiness or even the wealth that it was saying in one of the sutras um, of somebody that we don't like, somebody who we consider to be an enemy. We actually... Um, feel angry if somebody else acts for their benefit. And we can see this probably quite easily in fields like politics, right? In the political field, if, you know, say a group of, I don't know what you don't like, but most people don't like extremist groups. So whether far left, far right, and then we see somebody else who's supporting those groups, we tend not to like those people, right? Because they're supporting somebody we consider to be an enemy <clears throat> and we develop resentment. But it's quite interesting that in this sort of, it's kind of pointing to me towards a sense of acceptance and towards um, not necessarily allowing for harmful behavior, um, because I don't think that's the Buddha's teaching. I think that the Buddha actually very much encourages us to stand up for what's right and to speak out against injustice. But in some cases, especially where they have acted for one's harm or are acting for our harm, or perhaps that it's inevitable that they will, it might be best just to say, what can be done about it, yeah? What can we actually do about that? Because that at least is a kind of equanimity, a kind of acceptance, you know, realizing that at that moment, it's not gonna help the situation if we get angry, it's not going to actually um, encourage or prevent that person from causing harm. Perhaps at that point, it's only gonna harm ourselves even more. Right. And I think that's what it's pointing towards. So remember that this is a way of using the mind. It's not necessarily the case that we're sitting there doing nothing about it the next day when we have an opportunity. But it's about the way we think and we build our reality through thoughts. So you could see this as a kind of sense restraint learning to see what the mind's doing when something unpleasant or unwanted happens and deciding, making a decision that we could view it this way or we could view it another way. And in this case, the invitation is to view it with a sense of acceptance and putting something down that you can't actually control because it's not going to help you either way. So I think that's what it's getting at. And I can see that, oops, we did have someone with a hand raised, which is perfectly fine. A couple of people, I think Kim raised hers. And then, uh, okay, we've got two or three now. So if Kim still wants to speak, perhaps we should go to her. Otherwise, I'll let Kelly take it away. Yeah. Ah, okay, I answered Kim's question, apparently. All right, okay. Uh, shall I ask Nikki to unmute then? Fab, thank you. I can't see you. Where are you? Yeah, <laughs> uh, so lovely to see you. Interestingly, Ajahn Brahmi was talking about anger today in his um in his class. So okay. it was, yeah, that I think, oh my lord, that's saying something. 
um, and <sighs> since COVID, because interesting when you were reading that, and since COVID, <coughs> I've got so angry. I've really begun to get really angry and I've tried to ask questions about it and it'll be, let it go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's not helpful, I find. Yeah, I agree. But something you said when I think I first met you, and it really has helped, look under the anger, you know, really ask what the anger's about. So I think what's happening is I'm scared. Mm -hmm. Particularly where I live, the lot, um, they're building a lot of houses. And it's fright. I'm getting angry at the, what they're doing to nature, you know, to the nature. And I'm also angry at the change. I think it's I'm scared yeah. of change. Mm, mm, mm. Good insight. So I don't know. It's not gone, and it's in my stomach all the time, and I can't let it go. I try, no. and then it, yeah. face. It's like I'm faced with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Help. Great. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no. It's great. It's great that you've realised that there's something under the anger, and I think often when I've explored in myself, it's usually sadness or fear. Um, another insight that you just. Uh, raised which you might not necessarily always recognize as insight is that you know you're afraid of change and I think you know this is why we resist the truth of impermanence this is why we resist the Buddha's teachings because it's unpleasant for us we want to have stability we want to have security we want to find lasting happiness lasting friendship lasting whatever it is draw out whatever pleasure there is in life and make it last right so we do resist uh, change and um, sometimes I noticed when I was practicing a lot of Vipassana that most of what I interpret as pain in the body is actually just change. <laughs> like when you really get into the painful sensations in the body, and I'm not necessarily suggesting anyone do that, especially if you're more on the samadhi path. But in my practice at that time, I would notice that when the pain gets very intense, when you look underneath what's happening at, at all the pulsing and the throbbing and the heat, it's actually that something's changing in the body. It's actually change. And that can be painful. And I think that, you know, that is the same at the emotional level too. You know, it's painful because it's a fear of the unknown, isn't it? You know, we like something reliable and predictable. And the COVID pandemic, I mean, has just completely thrown our world upside down and in little pieces and spun it apart. <laughs> you know I was speaking for myself there too because all my support networks have seemingly disappeared or at least the ordinary ones that a monastic would rely on and we've had to look at completely different ways of living monastic life you know without community without the normal supports of the requisites and kind of be quite ingenious and inventive about how to um, you know still provide within the um, basic framework of the of the monastic rule so certainly change is uh, scary and it's wonderful that you're seeing that. It's also a sign that you're digging a bit deeper and that you've got an opportunity you know, to make peace with something you haven't yet made peace with. And I think that's one of the reasons that things like anxiety don't, don't go away when we resist them because they're presenting as an opportunity to understand them and to make peace with them. And we keep on saying, no, I don't want you. No, I don't want you. And the anxiety says, hey, I'm here to show you my true nature. And my true nature too is change. So if we can learn to actually trust the process of coming into contact and meeting that anxiety with kindness, with gentleness, with a sense of acceptance, you know, you could even use the sutta, the anxiety is arising, but what can be done about it? <laughs> what can be done about it? What can be done is that you can respond to it with kindness, with gentleness. And a sense of letting go doesn't mean letting go of it so that it goes away. It means letting go into it also, or letting it be. So this is the crucial step that's often missed when people talk about letting go. They think that they have the experience and the next step should be not to have the experience. But that's not really what letting go means. Letting go means meeting the experience and letting it be, letting it be. And it's that acceptance, that letting things be and that embracing even of them, you know, with gentleness that leads to their unraveling. Because everything has its life force and its, you know, process and it will come to an end on its own, but not when you want it to, when its causes disappear.
Yeah. One of the causes that keeps it going is the not wanting it, ironically. Because we're clinging, right? And that clinging fuels suffering. Clinging isn't only clinging to the good stuff. It's also clinging with a sense of, I don't want this. Ah, you know, you focus in on it, don't you? It's like with an enemy. Sometimes that anger is so close to love in a way, or not really love, but it's like, it does the same thing. It sticks you to that person. If you really got something against a person, you can't get them out of your head. You know, you're kind of stuck to them. You're clinging to that incident or to that situation or to that person that you have aversion toward. So in the same way with anxiety also, we can cling to it without realizing by wanting it to go away. It's not a problem, actually. It's just a phenomena that arises and you'll develop a lot of strength by learning to just stay present. Not all at once, not like for hours on end, but for short periods of time. And then, you know, give yourself a break, have a glass of water, do some grounding, you know, go on a walk, whatever it is. And try not to judge yourself for that. We'll ask Diana to unmute. Um, Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I, it was recently pointed out to me that the word resentment comes from the French ressentir, and sentir means to feel, and re is again. So it's to feel again. Um, so there's like this element of ruminating or mulling it over and it's not necessarily the minute something happens that you feel resentment it's over time when you what you just said venerable chanda you know like you're clinging to that person or that thought so i think yeah. that the um suggestion to just say well what can be done about it also implies it already happened so i might as well just let it go Right. It's not like you're seeing somebody do something wrong or know about it right in this moment. It's It's been built up over time. So I thought that was an interesting <laughs> nuance. Yeah, great. Yeah. Oh, thanks for adding that. That uh, makes a lot of sense. Because resentment is a kind of replaying of that thing that made you angry, isn't it? Like, it's just a building and a consolidating, like a replay of the anger. You're quite right. Yeah. Yeah, great. Bill, shall we go to Bill? Yep. Hey. Thanks. Hi. So can you talk more about that leaning in piece? <clears throat> because I'll recognize the the issue and the and what it is and the and it's that so there's full awareness, but it doesn't dissipate. And over time, it just keeps. So there'll be decades worth of resentment. Right. So uh -huh. Can you talk about that leaning in? There? Because that's that's where my practice is stuck. Okay. It's like, ugh, I carry yeah. the proverbial bag of potatoes over my back. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do you let it go? How do you how, how do you lean into right. that? Yeah. I guess this is where the practice of really understanding the suffering should lead eventually to a sense of nibida, which means a kind of being sick and tired of it, like really having had enough of it and not wanting to play that game anymore, like just turning away from it, but not out of aversion, but out of a sense of wisdom that, you know, I've just had enough of this. You've really explored it to the extent that you know, you, you just don't want to play there anymore. It's like you see that it's hurting you. You really see that it's hurting you. It could be perhaps related to the fact that by staying with something, you are getting underneath those layers of anger and resentment and you're touching into something more vulnerable, perhaps the sadness, perhaps the fear or the disappointment or um, the sense of injustice maybe, and in that, there can be a response. I think it's easier to have for a response of compassion to arise, especially a self-compassion. And at that point, 
you know, we, we start to, in a way, relate to it differently, relate to not only the feelings, but to ourselves with a bit more kindness and care. So there's a softness that comes in. And then, you know, when you've touched those emotions, if that resentment then comes back again and you start jumping into your head and, oh, I've got this thing from the past or this person, da, 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 you're more like, no, I just don't want to go there. I just want to be with myself. I just want to be with this feeling that's under it and really get at the heart of what's happening here. So there's kind of a turning away from the coarser aspect of that resentment or that anger and a move inward towards something a bit softer that starts to dissolve that consolidated or that like uh, solidified kind of heavy emotion that starts to fade but it can't be done through will it can't be done you know with a time limit um I think we have to be really really gentle I mean one thing is that sometimes I think you're right that just being aware is not enough sometimes just being aware kind of seems to heighten it and even exaggerate it it's like a magnifying glass but that can also be because we're looking at it it's like we're staring it down you know like we're getting kind of fixated on it and our attention is just too hard. It's like too, it's, it's slightly aversive. It's slightly hard. And at that time I tend to try to, I mean, if you can recognize you're doing that is like expand your awareness, just broaden it to include something else other than that. It's not like you're running away from it, but it's like you're feeling other parts of the body, for example. Say you've located it in a part of the body or you're staring it down as an emotion. Try to feel something else. Try to feel like the sensations on your hands or the air on your skin or, you know, your legs, feet, bum on the ground, something to ground you or even, you know, moving your awareness wider than that particular experience so even feeling sensing the room around you for example um other things you can do in your daily life are to um learn to train the mind in wholesome ways so to think in different ways about whatever it is that's um hurting you or harming you you know you might not want to like directly kind of look at the positive if if that feels like escaping from something really true like a really true trauma you don't always want to put a positive spin but you could look more towards um how it's hurt you and what kind of care you need at that time what kind of um what kind of uh attention you need like how to tend to your heart does that make sense how to kind of care for yourself in that emotion yeah. And of course, later we can actually the next sort is really nice for um, different ways to deal with someone who's hurt us again for resentment. Uh, you know, some of it is developing love and kindness, but there's some instances where we just want to sort of reflect that that person is subject to their own karma. You know, whatever they've done in the past, they're going to reap the results of that and there's nothing we can do you know and in, in other cases just to walk away from that situation so yeah different ways but yeah I guess the leaning in is like the danger is like staring it down being a bit harsh with it kind of being aware of it so that it disappears <laughs> whereas actually we need much gentler uh, mindfulness and to maybe include a little bit more of course you can also practice things like loving kindness there and then just in terms of thoughts or maybe self-compassion thoughts so you are um cultivating wholesome ways of just wholesome thoughts you know it softens the mind it softens the mind and it takes you out of that immediate kind of uh stuckness so a few things there but yeah i don't know if i got that to, to the point or yeah is that good? Something in there you can use. Great. <laughs> Excellent. So if there's nothing else in the chat box and no more raised hands for the moment, it would be great to get on to the next sutta, which is really wonderful. And there's probably quite a lot in this. So this is called the Buddha Teacher's Five Ways. It might be even worth getting a pen and paper or maybe write, underlining the five because it can be like a handbook, especially in the situation where anger is arising or even where, you know, you just have an issue 
with somebody over a long period of time or something. So community, there are these five ways of removing resentment by which a person should entirely remove resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. What five? Number one, one should develop loving kindness for the person one resents. In this way, one should remove resentment toward that person. So loving kindness is the first uh, recommendation by the Buddha. And just to say that these lists are often sequential. For example, in the Vitaka Santana Sutta on overcoming unwholesome thoughts, there are five methods there too, and they're in sequence. So the first is substitution, which means replacing an unwholesome thought with a wholesome thought. And if that doesn't work, he says that then try the next thing, which is, I think, seeing the danger in those unwholesome thoughts. So each one is a little subtler than the next. So you try with the more general one. And if that doesn't work, we go on to something else. And in a way, this loving kindness is a kind of substitution. It's like you're putting in a positive input. You're planting a particular seed in the mind, in the heart. And that overcomes for that moment any thought of anger, because the Buddha says in another sutta, the Dweda Vitaka Sutta, that's Majjhima 19. I only say this not to show that I know the suttas, but these two suttas on overcoming thoughts are really important. Number 19, number 20, Majjhima Nikaya. And there the Buddha says, you know, when you have a thought of loving kindness, it's not possible to have a thought of anger at the same time. When you have a thought of anger, you've actually given up the cultivation of loving kindness to have a thought of anger. So they don't coexist. So even if you feel like that thought of loving kindness is quite artificial, at least it's stopping, it's blocking an unwholesome thought for that time. And of course, over time, those thoughts start to become more and more habitual, more and more spontaneous, and can actually start to mold the mind. So this is an interesting one, developing loving kindness towards what the person one resents. And I think this is something that's really great when that resentment first arises before it's really set in, because it's fairly easy to overcome in the beginning. And it's also interesting that much of the time when loving kindness is taught, we learn to send it first to a loved person or to oneself. And that's really helpful, especially when we want to develop deep meditation through metta. But in the suttas, the Buddha actually recommends starting with a person you have resentment toward, because by that, you can remove anything that's going to become an obstacle for you in your meditation before it sets in. Yeah. So if you can, it's wonderful. And at the same time, I have a situation in my own life where that wasn't the best thing to do. Because by sending loving kindness to the person who'd actually abused me, it was re-traumatizing my mind. My mind wasn't ready. I didn't want to hold that object in my mind because it would bring up too much anxiety, too much fear. And I realized I have to put that aside for the time being and develop metta towards other people, maybe towards myself, maybe towards a loved person, and actually not bring that person to mind. Later on, that person came to mind when I was ready and I developed, it was easy. I didn't even have to develop it. They're just, the loving kindness just flowed. But in the beginning, it wasn't the right thing to do for me. So be very honest. And it's really nice to have a few, isn't it? Because then if one doesn't work or if one doesn't work one day, you can try another one. And, you know, each day might be different. Each moment might be different. So that's on the loving kindness. I wonder if we should already ask for any questions so far on that. I'll keep going. So number two, one should develop compassion, karuna or anukampa is another word, for the person one resents. In this way, one should remove the resentment towards that person. So compassion is not pity. Compassion is not poor you, that's, you know, they're just suffering, they're just not well. well but compassion is a real genuine wish that the other person come out of suffering. It's a real wish that that person be well and free from suffering, from anxiety, from perhaps harmful behavior. 
that we know is hurting them. Realizing that you can never hurt another person intentionally without developing a lot of negativity, a lot of unwholesome thoughts in the mind. Or perhaps that person's sick, perhaps they're really suffering, maybe they've been traumatized, maybe they've lost their job. You know, we don't have to always know why a person behaves the way they do to leave a little bit of space for compassion. I remember a long time ago, there was a grumpy nun in one of the monasteries I stayed in. And I didn't have much compassion for her because I thought anyone could say good morning, right? Anyone can just say good morning back to someone else who says good morning. But uh, later, when I realized that she'd had a trauma in her life, she'd lost a child. Suddenly I had all this compassion. You know, it was so easy to have compassion. And I realized she just, it wasn't that she couldn't say good morning. She just didn't particularly feel she wanted to be sociable. You know, her decision was to be a monastic and to just keep to herself and to work through whatever she had to work through. And I think she's still a nun and a good nun. And I wondered to myself after that, why did I have to know that that had happened to her in order to have compassion? Maybe I could have just, you know, asked, like, ask myself, perhaps she has, like, let's presume she has, whatever. This is kind of using thought in a skillful way, because until we're actually <clears throat> completely free from defilements, or at least the hindrances temporarily for a decent amount of time, we're not seeing things as they are anyway. So, you know, our aim isn't to see things completely objectively at this stage. We, you can be sure that we see things in a distorted way. So why not see them in a way that just gives a little more softness, a little bit more kindness to our heart. So compassion is a genuine uh, understanding. It arises from an understanding that, you know, everyone suffers. It doesn't even have to be as extreme, right, as losing a child. It could be a small thing, a seemingly small thing. And sometimes it's the small things that kind of push us over the edge and make us think, that's it. I've had enough. I can't go now. You know, you've had a bad day. You wake up on the wrong side of bed and then you trip. And it's like, that is it. My whole life is going down the drain. <laughs> so we never know what's happening for someone else. I find that quite a helpful thing. And it's also very, I think compassion is like an antidote to judgment, you know. Because we judge when we can't kind of empathize or consider that maybe something's been hard for another. And then the third one, one should develop equanimity towards the person one resents. In this way, one should remove the resentment towards that person. So this might be in a case where we haven't been able to develop loving kindness or compassion. Perhaps they're not that forthcoming, but we develop equanimity. We just perhaps realize there's nothing much we can do right now. Um, we don't have to particularly like that person. You know? Perhaps we can accept that people don't always behave the way we wish. Um, this can also be to ourself, by the way. So we can have equanimity. Okay, I'm doing my best for now. It won't always be this way. And also equanimity has a sense of like being able to get a perspective, you know, being able to stand back a little bit and see from above. Upeka actually means like up is like, um, above or over and peka is like look so it's kind of like look from above or yeah look with a little bit of perspective things happen that we don't like you know people behave in ways that we don't like pleasant and unpleasant experiences roll around each other you can never have one without the other so we develop this equanimity which also means they don't occupy our minds so much mm -hmm. So then that leads to number four, which is even a further extension of that to the point where one disregards the person one resents and pays no attention to them. In this way, one should remove the resentment towards that person. And here it's important to understand that we're not just like shunning somebody or shutting them out, out of callousness. We're doing this to remove resentment towards that person, to work on ourselves. Right. So because we can't face that person at this time with any equanimity or compassion or loving kindness, um, perhaps it does really create more suffering in us to bring them to mind. So we disregard them in order to remove resentment so that later we can come back to them, maybe not physically, but at least mentally um, with a little bit more 
equanimity, perhaps even kindness, depending how things go. And in a way, that was what I did in this particular case. I just decided not to bring them to mind. I mean, it wasn't suppressing it. It would come to mind enough on its own. But um, I didn't want to intentionally bring them to mind. And I also didn't pay attention, for example, with like correspondence. You know, they were trying to write to me without actually apologizing just as if nothing had happened and it was too difficult for me to I didn't I wasn't prepared to communicate at that level you know to pretend nothing had gone wrong and so yeah I did say to that person I'm sorry I'm not able you know to be in correspondence at this point before I've received a proper apology and actually to this day I never received one 12 years on so but it doesn't matter anymore because the loving kindness came when it was ready so sometimes we can do that. I think it's quite freeing, isn't it? That the Buddha's here saying we can do that. You don't have to be friends with everyone. You don't have to like make it better. Sometimes it can't be made better. And it's giving you a bit of space to work things out. And then the fifth one is one should apply the idea of the ownership of karma to the person one resents. Thus, this venerable one or this unvenerable one <laughs> is the owner of their karma the heir of their karma and karma means action here so it, it, it's specifically referring here to to things they've done in the past and to the results of those things the fact that they are going to yield results in the future so one should apply and you know if that intention that action has been wholesome then it's going to lead to wholesome results for that person if it's been unwholesome then that person's going to face suffering in the future so Reflecting on this, one should apply the idea of ownership of karma. The venerable one is the owner of their karma, the heir of their karma. They have karma as their origin, karma as their relative, karma as their resort, and will be the heir to any karma they do, good or bad. In this way, one should remove the resentment towards that person. These are the five ways of removing resentment by which a monk, a nun, a layman, a laywoman, or a non-binary person should entirely remove resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. So that's the five, which I think is quite rich and a lot to work with. And uh, you can see that last one also contains quite a lot of wisdom. It's a kind of extension of equanimity, really. Uh, realizing that there's only so much we can do to help another person. You know, ultimately, they have to be the ones to make those changes in their lives. Mm -hmm. And we can lead by example, but we can't always, as they say in England, lead the horse to water. You can show where the water is, but you can't drag them there. So, questions? I will ask Mira to unmute. Um, hello everybody, it's nice to see you again. Um, I was thinking about karma, because it's also possible that a part of my karma to meet this person. And this is when, when I have met her with myself or self-compassion, then I can say perhaps in the past of this life or the previous lives, I did the same thing. For now, I'm experiencing, I'm, I'm experiencing now this kind of unwholesome actions that are coming to me because of my karma. I, I'm fixed to this. I, it's coming into my life because I did something in the past that was something unwholesome. I, I don't know too much about this dependent origination comma thing, but it's a, it's a kind of um, thinking that, that I've got now just not as a victim of something that is not um, not wholesome, but as, as being um, someone who did something unwholesome. All right. Ah. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank yeah. Can I ask you to um, unmute it again? Because there's a bit of feedback from your um, from your headphones or something from your computer. Uh, but if you want to continue with a, another question or comment, that's fine. Um, but just to comment on what you've already shared. Uh, 
It's interesting, yes. I mean, the way you're using the word comer there sounds to me a little bit more like comer as destiny or comer as fate, which is not exactly how the Buddha described it. And yet, of course, the Buddha did very clearly say that some things are because of past comer. I think the difficulty with that can be that we may presume and often this is a mistake many Buddhists make, that everything that we experience is due to something we've done in the past and therefore we deserve it and therefore it's kind of unchangeable and it's kind of our destiny or it's kind of something we have to suffer through. And that can be dangerous to, to think in that way because we can't know whether something is really coming to us because of our karma or just because of some other cause. So the Buddha said that karma is only one of the causes for things to happen and there are six or so other causes, but actually it's probably much more than that as well. However, even though we can't know whether it's true or not, I think it's about finding skillful means. And so if that thought or that way of looking helps to undermine anger and resentment, it can be useful as long as it doesn't put you in a situation where you feel you don't have a choice or you don't have control. I think it can sometimes be a useful way of looking at things because, you know, it's very probable. I mean, I don't tend to do it as, okay, well, I did something in the past that made this happen, but I tend to look at it more as perhaps I've been this way in the past, just like they are this way now. Maybe I've been that person. Maybe I've been that, you know, and that can help me feel that I'm not different from them and that, uh, you know, I have no right to judge them also. Um, and yeah, it, it creates less of a sense of separation, more of a sense of empathy and kindness. Um, and also, yeah, perhaps it can be useful in the sense that maybe I have something to learn from this person, right? Maybe there's a reason they've crossed my path. I mean, of course, there's a reason every, everybody crosses our path, but it's, we give it the reason in a sense, like, it's not like it's destined, but it's more like, how can we make use of it to grow, to develop ourselves in skillful ways, to develop our heart in more kindness, peace, wisdom, etc. Like we can always make use of everything that comes as long as it's not harming you, because then in a way you could say that's your karma, that you're not protecting yourself, right? We also have to be kind and compassionate to ourselves. So yeah, I'd say just the main thing is that, you know, that danger that we might feel we then deserve something that we don't actually deserve as such, uh, because we make our karma, we make our choices every moment. Um, but just to, yeah, I think there's some, definitely that's valid if it helps, you know, and, and that's a very personal thing. I've definitely been through whole years of practice where I've used that perception a lot. And at that time it was helpful for me. Do you want to come back with, with something there? You're welcome. Um, it's it's probably only for the, the feeling of resentment. Because mm. okay. it's, it's in your own mind that you're fixing on it. Yeah. And if you're able to let it go, then you can perhaps resolve this whole situation. Mm. It's, it has nothing to do anymore with the person or something that has happened. Yeah. But it is the mind that grabs it and cling to it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really then the, the opportunity to let it go, and that's the problem to solve. Yeah, and it's a way right. of growing, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, it's not only negative, because there is so, so many things, because, uh, for instance, when, when someone gets sick or has a cancer or something like that, there are several people who say, well, you're, you ate the wrong things, yeah. you thought wrongly or True. things like that, it's it's completely wrong, um, yeah. and it should never be like this, but yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. the form of resentment, it's something else, I think. Yeah, 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 that's a really good point, mm. yeah, yeah, I get your point, yeah, because often there is a reason, right, <laughs> that somebody yeah. is, uh, is resentful to us, yeah. there might be something we haven't seen, <laughs> yeah, yeah. definitely, great, yeah. great, thank you, yeah. We'll ask Diana to unmute. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you to speak to something that Mira actually just brought up, which is the danger of developing a sense of superiority. I've seen that, yeah. you know, where people are like, oh, that's their karma, you know, yeah. or spiritual bypass. Yeah. Risk for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, very good point. And I think, um, you know, again here, that's part of the genius of the sequence that the comma is actually the last way of reflecting. So in this case, the person hopefully would already have developed kind, loving kindness and compassion and equanimity. So it wouldn't be a dismissal. It would be something that's born of a genuine understanding um, through loving kindness. And I guess I've had direct experience of coming to that place myself while practicing the Brahma Viharas because I was practicing with loving kindness and then changed my object to another person. And then from that other person, the metta just naturally morphed into compassion because it's essentially the same thing. It's just love that when it meets suffering becomes compassion. And from that compassion, I just had this real sense of perspective and equanimity over this person's life. And I had this definite kind of feeling of like not linking things in her life that had led her to feel a certain way because I couldn't possibly say but just that all beings are kind of in this round of samsara and we're just experiencing all kinds of things due to causes and conditions that we don't really understand and we don't have a lot of control over and it just gave me a real sort of sense of acceptance and it was born of love I would say it was born of compassion and love and it didn't have any judgment in it so I think the, the order here is important. If, if we're just going straight to that one, well, it's their karma. It's like Goenkaji used to say, I don't know if you remember, Diana, I know you've done Goenka courses. Goenkaji said, you know, it's not like, oh, they suffer for their karma, you know, let, <laughs> like they suffer for their karma, just leave them alone. Or, you know, I suffer for my karma. Let anybody come like a vegetable and cut me up. <laughs> And he, he always sounds very charming with his Indian accent, you know, like, let anybody come like a vegetable, just cut me up, <laughs> cut me into little pieces. And uh, yeah, and it's really sweet. And it's really funny when he says that because, so, because it's true, right? People have that um, feeling like, oh, yeah, you know, it's my karma, just let, let, let the steam truck roll right over me. <laughs> And this doesn't really uh, embody the Buddha's teaching because metta and karuna are kind of fearless. You know, metta is to the extent that a mother would risk her own life for her child. That's the extent of loving kindness we have to develop before we just dismiss another person. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with you there on that danger. Ellen, can we come to you? Yeah, I'll ask Ellen to unmute. Uh, I was thinking about that sequence because often we say with number two compassion that you should reflect on the karmic results that it will bring uh, and have compassion because of that so then it's like you're going from number five to number two but we, if we're only supposed to do number five as a last resort then can we go straight to number two in another way and be on <laughs> number five if you see what I mean. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely I think it's not fixed it's um it's just a matter of having sort of something to hand and some of these things are maybe more ready readily available like the loving kindness is the obvious antidote but I think you know sometimes it's far less intellectual than that it's much more spontaneous and organic and I think if that works for you, then that's perfectly fine. The Buddha's not going to say, sorry, you didn't do number one, two, three. You know, go back to the beginning. If something's working for you, then that's a good thing. I guess it's just about recognizing that there's all these different ways and it's good to try and practice all of them. And I think we naturally do, right? Because our lives will give us different situations where, you know, sometimes one will just be the natural response and another time something else will work. And Perhaps we might forget that, and so the Buddha writes it down, or he didn't. He speaks it, right? He didn't write it down, but he collects these things because they can all work. So I think it comes more from his observation of life, you know, and maybe his observation that this one is more commonly used or more likely to more often bring results, but that all of them can apply. And I think so often in all these lists, they strengthen each other, you know. The more compassion you have, the more you understand karma, the more metta you have, the more compassion you have, the more equanimity, the more, you know, they all strengthen each other because they're basically good qualities of the mind. So, yeah, that's totally fine. And uh, some of us are stronger in one area and that's fine too, you know. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> good. 
Woohoo, we've got a whole 20 minutes and a massive sutta ahead. So I wonder if we should continue or if there's anything else to say. Maybe we should make use of the 20 minutes. Yes? Shall I read? Are you ready for more? <laughs> so this is Sariputta teaches five ways. And the Venerable Sariputta was the Buddha's right hand monk. He did have right hand nuns. I, uh, Venerable Kemar was his right hand nun, but it's less rarely touched upon. Um, but this was his right hand monk. And of course, the Venerable Kemar was also the right hand nun to, uh, to who the Buddha, yeah, I guess. But she would have had her own right hand nuns as well. So, anyway, the Sariputta was um, praised by the Buddha as being uh, the foremost in wisdom next to him, like the wisest person next to him, like his own son. But of course, any fully enlightened being is uh, fully wise to the Four Noble Truths and to the nature of reality. So, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the monastics. Friends, there are these five ways of removing resentment. So this is another five. By which a person or a monastic should entirely remove resentment when it has arisen toward anyone. So what five? Here, a person's bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure. One should remove resentment towards such a person. So I'll just pause here to say that that might sound a bit um, vague. Well, their bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure and we should remove resentment. But the point is that we should focus on the part of that person that's pure. So the point here is that even though they do things which are unwholesome, unskillful, harmful, but their verbal behavior is actually wholesome and skillful and, and beneficial, we can bring to mind the wholesome and that will help us to see that this person is not all bad right that there's some redeeming qualities in this person there's something to respect something to admire so it's not to overlook the other things but it's to just bring to mind something to counter that resentment and that ill will and there'll be some examples later on okay so these are just examples number two a person's verbal behavior is impure but their bodily behavior is pure. One should also remove resentment towards such a person. Number three, a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, a placidity of the mind. And one should also remove resentment towards such a person. So there is again some goodness there in the mind they can even get quite calm peaceful and feel contented from time to time maybe even enter samadhi number four a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure and they do not gain an opening of the mind a placidity of the mind from time to time one should also remove resentment towards such a person so here you don't have an opposite way to do that but there'll be a way given later a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior, number five, a person's bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, a placidity of the mind, and one should remove resentment towards such a person also. So this is interesting because even when their bodily and verbal behavior are pure and they have a pure mind as well, um, still we might have resentment toward them. It's possible, right? Even the Buddha had his enemies. No, I even I can get irritated with my teacher, <laughs> even though I know he's so pure hearted, but still nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> and we're not perfect. So, and then the Buddha continues, how friends should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily behavior is impure, but verbal behavior is pure. Suppose a rag-robed monastic sees a rag by the roadside. They would press it down with their left foot and spread it out with their right foot, tear off an intact section and take it away with them. So too, when a person's bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of their bodily behavior, 
but should instead attend to the purity of their verbal behavior. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So this example here about the rag that one sees on the roadside is obviously very related to monastic life in the days of the Buddha, because in those times, some of the monastics were rag robe wearers, and they'd actually find the material for their robes from the street, from the road, even from the charnel grounds. And of course, those rags were often very filthy. And so that is as though you're seeing that filth in the person's bodily behavior in this case. But then you can also see that there's something useful in that rag. You can actually pull away a part of it. So here they press it down with their foot and tear off an intact section with their feet. So they're not actually touching it. They're not getting too close to it. But they're able to take off that piece of the rag, which can be useful, and actually take it away with them. So in the same way, we can take away with us some redeeming feature of this person, maybe some speech that they've said to us, you know, maybe somebody's done something horrible to us now, but in the past they've said something very helpful, very kind, they've given us a leer, you know, they've um, tried to encourage us or they've apologized maybe in the past. No? So we can bring that to mind and keep that in our heart so that whenever that irritation, that anger and resentment arises towards their, whatever it is they've done with their body, um, we can remember that they can sometimes say really beautiful things as well. And we can keep bringing that up. So in this way, resentment towards the person can be removed. So it's just an example because obviously nobody's got entirely pure bodily behavior and entirely unwholesome or whatever, the opposite. Um, it's just an example as to how a person isn't only one thing. Number two. How, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose verbal behavior is impure, but whose bodily behavior is pure? So another simile. Suppose there was a pond covered with algae and water plants. A person might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would plunge into the pond sweep away the algae and water plants with their hands and drink from their cupped hands and then leave. So too, when a person's verbal behavior is impure but their bodily behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of their verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of their bodily behavior. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So that's quite lovely, isn't it? Because in this case, you're almost immersing yourself in the goodness of that person, in the goodness of their bodily behavior. You know, the simile is that you move away that algae, that verbal behavior, you know, you just put it away, put it out of your mind, um, not suppressing it, but just not giving it much attention. And I think back to the time before I was a monastic, a long time ago, before I went for the Pali course in India. I, I went there to uh, study for a year, but also to serve and sit a lot of meditation in the, the main Vipassana center, Dhammagiri, in uh, India. Uh, and before I went there, I had, took this nursing home job. So I was a care worker in a nursing home for people with, um, it was called elderly mentally infirm, but it was really people with last stage dementia. and. Uh, one of the staff members was very coarse and rough in her speech. She used a lot of F words and she'd be cursing so much of the time. And at first I was like, oh my goodness, what is this? You know, I don't think I belong here. Like, of course, I'm not like that. They're very working class, you know. <laughs> this isn't good company for me. Like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> cursing and, you know, swearing all night long. I mean, it was like every second word kind of thing. And then I looked at her and got to know her more. And I saw that all her swearing, first of all, was about her irritation that the people there didn't have better care. Also sometimes like frustration uh, with the job, but my goodness, she was so dedicated to those people. And she was just there, you know, at a finger click to help clean them up and change the bed and, you know, make sure they weren't doing terrible things with their feces. I mean, it was really a difficult place to work. And she said to me once, you know, I could make more money working in the shop, but I just don't want to do that because here I can really help people and I really love them. I really love the residents. 
you know, she wasn't getting anything back from these people. They were far too into the, you know, late stage dementia to be able to uh, express any kind of gratitude or even for it to be obvious how we were really helping them. You know, sometimes you wondered, is it really any benefit other than keeping them clean? But, um, you know, she was working just to preserve their dignity with her full heart. And I think that I often think of her when it comes to this simile, because it just didn't matter how she spoke, what she was doing, and her intention was the most important thing. The rest was conditioning, you know, it was from being a single mother to three kids. She said, you know, she sometimes had to feed them just crisps in the evening because there wasn't much money to afford a proper food, you know, and kids want crisps and, you know, stuff that just gives them a sugar fix or a salt fix. Uh, but yeah, she had a heart of gold. She really had a heart of gold. So we can do this, huh? we can look at the way people actually, what they actually do. Even some of these, uh, I don't know why I'm thinking politicians, probably because I'm at my parents' house, so I hear a lot more news than normal. And some of the words and stuff are pretty bad. And But, well, I suppose their actions are quite bad. <laughs> but there are these people, aren't there, whose words are actually much worse than what they actually do. And if they actually came across somebody, you know, struggling or suffering, they'd be unlikely to be so callous as to turn away. So, gosh, we've almost come to the end of our time together. Um, I think the next simile is still related. So let's read the next one and then we'll stop before the last two for tonight. So the next one is number three. How, friends, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure, but who from time to time gains an opening of mind, placidity of mind? So this is another case of looking for the goodness. Suppose there was a little water in a puddle. Then a person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. They would think, this little bit of water is in the puddle. If I try to drink it with my cupped hands or a vessel, I'll stir it up, disturb it and make it undrinkable. Let me get down on all fours, suck it up like a cow and depart. <laughs> Have you ever thought that? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Let me suck it up like a cow and depart. <laughs> then they get down on all fours and suck up the water like a cow and depart. So too, when a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of their bodily and verbal action, but should instead attend to the opening of the mind, the placidity of the mind that they gain from time to time. In this way, resentment toward the person should be removed. So isn't that quite nice? And just to point out another nuance here is that the person with the resentment here, hoping to overcome the resentment, arrives afflicted and oppressed by the heat. So we're presuming, right, that anger's making us suffer. We know that anger's making us suffer and that we're trying to quench our thirst. So rather than meeting a person who makes us angry and focusing on their negative sides, we're already angry. We actually want to focus on something that's going to make us feel better. And in this case, because that person doesn't have a lot going for them. They just have occasional openings of the mind. That means occasionally their mind becomes peaceful and calm. Maybe there's a sense of well-being. We have to be very gentle and careful as to how we approach them. You know, their bodily and verbal behavior is quite coarse. But if we're very gentle and careful and we get down like a, a cow, you could almost think of it as humility in a way, right? And you sort of try to connect to that goodness. You know, you try to give them a chance. You know, some people have to do that, actually. I mean, I made a joke of it getting down like a cow just with the language because it's quite evocative. But, you know, in some countries, people actually have to do this. They have to... Uh, try to drink from dirty water and you can imagine how it would stir it up if you approach it too quickly or too carelessly and so in the same way we have to be extremely gentle and cautious I would say right lest we actually get damaged in the process but we may be able to see and I've noticed that so many times right when someone approaches you perhaps with anger 
if you just see their humanity, their basic humanity, and can relate to them with a bit of patience, you know, with a, a kind of a gentleness. After a while, their defenses drop a little bit and they calm down. You can see, oh, they are just somebody who's maybe had a terrible day, whatever it might be. So this is really about, again, the subject of sense restraint and looking in ways that helps us with our own personal development, our own growth on the spiritual path. And, uh, and this is all a very skillful way to, to keep the mind kind of as balanced and as wholesome as possible during the day so that when you come to meditate on your cushion, you don't have to do it all there and then. <laughs> you don't have to kind of go through all the kind of angry thoughts. And you've actually kind of uh, dealt with it a little bit already by the way you use your mind throughout the day. So it's kind of like keeping your cupboards or keeping your bedroom tidy so that when you go to sit, uh, there's not so much to sort out. So I hope that was of some help. And uh, yeah, we're getting a little bit further in this uh, wonderful chapter. And um, there'll be another sort of class next week I think and after that I'm going to be away for a while on retreat so they're not going to stop but you'll have to be a little patient so that I can do my deeper work of uh, removing those obstacles in the mind to my deep meditation and liberation and come back with more to share so hope to see you next week and I hope you enjoyed the class uh, please write any comments if you wish or any questions that have not been touched or anything um, we can always look at them later and I'll invite uh, someone to say a few words hello someone you are inviting me <laughs> thank you Gunter <laughs> thank you um, I just want to point out, like so often, that today's session is offered on a donation basis in uh, the spirit of generosity, and that any contribution you are able to make is very gratefully received and will help support Venerable Chandra's physical needs and the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards a full bhikkhuni ordination. Thank you for your ongoing support and may I say if some of us are a little bit angry that they always come at the end with the donation talk possibly you can think about ways to overcome it <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh very good even donating is a way to overcome it <laughs> just kidding that's terrible Ajahn Brahm style <laughs> yeah very good no, I'm sure that everybody appreciates your Dana talk, Gunter, and thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for coming and for all your amazing support in whatever way you're able to support. And even just, you know, coming, not just, but your practice, coming to these sessions and contributing and learning the Dhamma is the most amazing support and gives me a lot of satisfaction. So thank you for being here. And uh, yeah. Thank you for your kindness in the chat box. It's very nice. I always read every little message because it makes me happy. So if you like reading nice messages, then you could even write nice messages to yourself. Actually, somebody in this group told me they're writing a gratitude journal and I ought to start mine again because it's so nice to reflect on all the things we're grateful for in life. And uh, certainly for me, one of those is being able to be here together. It's interesting because sometimes I'm really exhausted and I think I'm not sure I can calm, you know, I'm not feeling great and not sure. And, and I come and I just, yeah, I just feel so much more resourced and happy and a lot more meaning in my life when I come to these sessions. So I love this comment. The next time I get upset, I'll just suck it up like a cow. <laughs> that's very good and just <laughs> hopefully get a little bit of quenched thirst <laughs> great oh thank you everybody it's wonderful to hear from you and uh, we can probably unmute you now so that if you wish we'll stop the recording and you can wave goodbye <laughs>